So on the matter of whether Christ died for only a few, paid the penalty for only a few, just the elect, or not, a careful examination of the coordinate doctrines of the faith that corroborate one another is tantamount to deciding this issue as all issues that are doctrinal. Do all the doctrines of the Bible fit together perfectly and not contradict one another? So we have a doctrine that it is all to the glory of God whether an individual is saved or condemned. And that doctrine permits the doctrine of unlimited atonement. atonement. And it shuts the door on limited atonement. Because God doesn't get all the glory then. Compare Romans 9, 22 to 24. What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? That's clear. He gets all the glory. God is omnipotent. His purposes can never be defeated. And this is an important point to consider. Just as God created a perfect earth and then created perfect mankind to dwell on it in perfect harmony with him forever, but man's rebellion resulted in a change in this scenario such that now not all men will enjoy such an experience even though God had made provision for all men. So in the same way, God has provided for the salvation for all mankind. But any man's refusal to trust alone in Christ alone will deny him the opportunity to be saved and dwell with him forever. In neither case is God's plan thwarted, for this is precisely what he had decreed and what will occur. And in neither case has God miscalculated, for it all was decreed by him to prove out that given free will, man will inevitably choose to rebel. So God is therefore justified in instituting a universe which is ruled totally under his sovereignty and no one else's. He's justified to do that, and he gets all the glory. Otherwise, shared it with man, man is not equal with God. Why should man share the podium with God as far as the glory is concerned? As a matter of fact, the Noahic flood, the failure of the Mosaic law period, the evident failure of the church age, we look at the church age that we belong to now, do you think that's a great success? And of all of God's sovereignly decreed dispensations, economies, have been prophesied to and will end in failure for this reason. But God has to give man the opportunity to share the glory with him, he can't force man not to have the opportunity and then take all the glory for himself. Especially when it's by his grace all things have occurred, and but by his decree all things do occur, good and bad and good and evil. He doesn't invent evil, but permits it. And that evil actually disqualifies man from sharing in the glory of God. Is God defeated if men are lost? Lewis Berry Chafer. Very important point. Consider this. This is the whole crux of the matter of whether Calvinism, Calvinism is correct or not. This question relates to the larger question as to whether any sin or defiance of God means that God is defeated. Actually, the total process of people being saved or unsaved brings glory to God because it is manifest his infinite attributes are made manifest. Okay. There is no defeat for God because his purposes are perfectly being perfectly fulfilled even by the judgment on the lost in which his holiness and righteousness are revealed. Rejecting Christ and his redemption as every unbeliever does is anticipated in the plan of God, though at the same time it is not according to the wishes of God who is benevolent in his relationship to all mankind. 
gives you free will those things they'll choose to do. As stated in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you and not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Can he do that and yet let what happens, happens? Yes. Is he glorified? Yes, because he gave man free will. And let's see what men do with free will. The view that all men are saved by Christ's death for them is not supported in Scripture. For both the lost and the elect are equally regarded as unregenerate and unsaved until the individuals involved place their trust in Christ, those who do or don't. The doctrine of election relative to salvation may better be comprehended if we understand that it is the infinite glory of God and the finite will of man which are simultaneously involved in man's eternal destiny. We didn't get fabricated or created as, a, as robots. If Scripture teaches that everything is to be the glory is to the glory of God, and Scripture does teach that, Romans eleven thirty six read, for far for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Not shared with anybody else. But does He have to take the spotlight on purpose? No. He has it because He qualifies to have it, but allows man to participate. And even there, man's participation is by the grace of God when it's successful. And if God's word indicates that each individual is accountable for his eternal destiny, and it does indicate that, compare John 3.18. Let's take a look at John 3.18. People don't read past 3.16. That's important. Context includes reading all the passages that are significant, especially something like John 3.18. Three, sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten or one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So there's a choice there. Sounds like not all will choose to believe, right? Keep reading. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And then here's 3.18. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. So we're all as if we're under condemnation, and we are, before we choose to believe if we do. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So he who believes in him is not judged, not condemned. He who does not believe has been judged already. From the point of conception on, is you're under condemnation because he has not believed in the name of the one and only, only begotten Son of God. See, it's only or unique, only one of his kind, and begotten of a woman. That's unique. So, that's it. God gives you the chance. You have a chance to prove yourself by trusting alone in Christ alone. And that's by the grace of God in the first place. Take a look. Romans 11, 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory of God forever. And if God's word indicates that each individual is accountable for his eternal destiny, and it does, we just read John 3, 18, then in order for God to receive all the glory, one must then conclude that God's omnipotence, all-powerful capacity, unlimited, is so unfathomably infinite over man's finite will that whether man chooses to believe or to not believe, God still gets the glory. So God is not defeated if men are lost, his purpose and will being perfectly fulfilled, even when men do not receive Christ as Savior. So when you, if you conclude otherwise, then you say, well, God, yeah, Jesus Christ can only die for the elect because God was defeated if um, he died for the non-elect and they chose not to believe, which inevitably they do. That's of their free will to do that. Even though God is not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3, 9, 
man must still choose which it will be for him, heaven or hell. And those who reject God's love and sacrifice do not defeat God's purpose, but rather fulfill it. For without God's gift of faith, fallen man, fallen man inevitably chooses hell. So I just can't fathom when that time when I was born again, when I was 17, Madison Square Garden, and the teacher offered such a marvelous settling of my eternity to be in heaven with God for the rest of eternity. And I wouldn't choose, I know I don't want it. Wow. Thus proving that it is God alone who must be sovereign in the universe. God, man given his capacity and ability to choose to do good and evil and believe or not believe. He cannot share the universe and the glory of God when it's going to be a failure for God. No man can attain the righteousness of God without the grace of God operating in his life from start to finish. Did you hear that? No man can attain the righteousness of God without the grace of God operating in his life from start to finish. You start by trusting alone in Christ alone, passive, not proactive, trust, belief, except is true, what Christ did for you, everything, he did it all. You believed. And then, by God's grace, because you didn't earn that, faith doesn't earn you anything. You, faith uh, it just trust in what God has already done for you. Then, God fulfills his promise and completes your redemption, perfect resurrection body, and there you are, serving along with God, co-ruling with Jesus Christ in the universe because of the grace of God. God gets all the glory, of course. But we are trophies of his. So we share in his glory in that way. E, point E, since all men, elect and non-elect, are sinners. People don't seem to realize that if you're elect, doesn't mean you're, you're uh, sinless. And since Calvary provided for all sinners, and we've seen that already, we've investigated it thoroughly, then Christ died for all men. Point one in this is there is no distinction in Scripture between elect and non-elect sinners in their regenerate state, in their unregenerate state. Sometimes a typo is critical. So there is no distinction in Scripture before we got saved amongst all the population of mankind. Some get saved at age 17 like I did, others a lot earlier, others later. There is no distinction in Scripture between elect and non-elect sinners in their unregenerate state. They're all, all under condemnation. We just saw that in John 3.18. There's no distinction in Scripture between elect and non-elect sinners in their unregenerate state. In other words, all men are totally depraved and incapable of providing anything toward their own salvation. However, that total depravity, unable to commit to uh, do anything that's of righteous value, perfect righteousness, toward our salvation we can share in the glory of God but our trusting alone in Christ alone would please God but it's not a contribution is it it's an, it's an acceptance of what God contributes completely for you Romans three nineteen and 23 now we know that whatever the law says the law of Moses the epitome of rules of human behavior it speaks to those who are under the law and that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be become accountable to God. And here's the jump to 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Kenneth Weiss says, Kenneth Weiss says, have sin, that phrase, is constitutive arist, meaning a panoramic view of the human race is doing nothing except committing sin. One commission after another continuous, constitutive. Even the good that all men do is contaminated with whatever motivations come out of every man's sin nature and is therefore unacceptable to God. On the appearance of mankind looking at mankind, yes, it looks good, but inside inner motivations, uh, reservations. Wist says, again, the root word which is translated as sin is hamartano, to miss the mark, thus to fall in obeying the law, come short in his present tense, indicate